Welcome into the show, Paris Jackson. How are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Thanks so much for coming in. I know you don't do a ton of interviews, so I really appreciate you being here, showing up. There's so much to get into. Your new music, mm -hmm. Luke from the Struts, Cheap Trick, Motley Crue. We can talk about music all day long. So I'm excited to get into it. But first and foremost, I want to talk about your path and your journey in life. So take me back to the beginning, if you don't mind, Paris. Like, Tell me about your childhood and musically what you really got inspired by growing up. Um, that in itself would take probably the whole the whole sit down because I was I was really <laughs> just exposed to so much as a kid. Actually, I was telling a friend of mine last night. Um, my my friend was telling me the the story of the first time he ever heard like Barry White, and he was sixteen. And I was like, wow, you know, like I never had an experience like that with one of the older classic artists because I was raised around it. I never had like a first memory with Aretha Franklin. I never had like a first memory with, you know, Earth, Wind and Fire or even like Mozart and Debussy and Tchaikovsky, like the more classical, because it was just always around. Like I never had a first Beatles experience because it was always playing in the house as a kid. Um, and so in some ways I feel like I'm lucky because I had that exposure and, and um, experience growing up. But I also feel like I was robbed of the experience to discover it on my own, almost. But um, but I did get to have that uh, that oh my god moment with newer bands like Radiohead and um, Bright Eyes. Do you remember like the first record you bought or maybe you listened to or your first kind of musical? I mean, because I know at some point you took a turn into like hard rock and Motley mm -hmm. Crue and as I mentioned, Cheap Trick and a lot of the Alice Cooper. There's so much that you love that I love, mm. which is one of the reasons I was decided to sit down with you. I think you even have like a Motley Crue tattoo. For, you have two. You have two, which is amazing. So, yeah. um, but but tell me about that term because at a certain point, obviously the, there's the R and B influence we spoke about. But you took a turn and you got into I guess maybe in high school and you started listening to a lot of grunge and mm. emo and things like that. So when did that happen? And talk to me about your kind of musical path leading up to that. Um. Yeah, I think I think it first it first started with with Motley Crue and a boy who introduced me to Motley Crue as my first love, and that set me on this path of you know Van Halen and Def Leppard and uh, Poison and uh, bands in that category. And then over the span of that next year, I started discovering the grungier bands on my own: Pixies, Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana. Um, Interpol. And those are a lot of the bands that I'm really taking from with uh, my newer stuff. Um, but I think my first album that I ever bought, at least on wax, like my first vinyl I ever bought was Too Fast for Love. Amazing. Amazing record. By, by the way, I think that was actually one of my first records. 1987, I believe. It was on Leather Records. It came out. One of the greatest records ever. The year it came out? The year it came out. 1981. Oh, was it 81? It was 81. Oh, I moved to LA in 87. I don't know why I thought 81. 87 was closer to <laughs> Dr. Feelgood. Right, right, right. True. I love how you know that. And so that really resonated with you for some reason, right? And that yeah. music. So now you can you can hear that in your music now. But ultimately, you then took a turn. You got into emo, right? I think at a certain point. Um, the, the emo stuff that I discovered has actually been more recently, like in the last few months, I've started listening to bands like uh, like Brand New. Um, and that's more like, and Built to Spill, kind of like the older classical, like not classical, but classic Midwest emo, like the originals. Um, but... Bright Eyes. Are they considered emo? I think so. I mean, that's sort of around that time period, right? Then yes, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Manchester Orchestra, which we'll get into too. So you went, you were homeschooled for a while, mm -hmm. and then you went to private school. And did you bond with the kids in school over music, or not really? No, other than that, that one boy who showed me Motley Crue. Right. Yeah, and he's kind of the only one. And you started playing guitar around thirteen, but I feel like I feel like you almost suppressed music early on because you weren't sure that was what you. It was more of a hobby for you initially. Yes. Yes, that is correct. And so, and now it's funny because you talk about, I think I heard you say something that you don't really consider yourself a singer, mm -mm. but you know, you have an incredible voice. Oh, thank you. And and some of the best singers, I mean, there's people like Anthony Kiedis and people like that that are great showmen, but yeah. I don't know if everyone's known for their technique, right? So how do you see yourself in that realm? I mean, you obviously see yourself as a performer. More so than anything, if I had to put a label on it, the closest thing to it would just be songwriter. Mm. Like less of a performer and less of a singer and more of just like a songwriter. 
And at what point did you discover Radiohead? Because we can do an hour on Radiohead only. Oh, God. Uh, I, I fell madly in love with them a couple of years ago, um, but I'd been exposed to it. Like, I, I knew the songs that had played on the radio because, like, going to school and stuff, I always listened to the more alternative and, and rock stations um, in L.A. What, what is it so. about Tom York that really resonates with you? And even his side projects, I believe, Adams for Peace and mm -hmm. things and like Smile, that. The Smile, which is his newer one. Um, I don't. I don't know if I, I'd ever be able to describe why. It's just. Um, it just. It does something to my brain and my heart and my soul. That's just like uh, everything I want from music. It's interesting because I really, for me, I really take to the first couple records. Mm -hmm. And when he got a little bit weird with some of the electronica stuff, mm -hmm. especially the solo record. But I think the bands is. No Their question best. for me, one of the top 10 rock records ever. And, and I'm going to later on, we'll talk about your records that you can't live without. But which of the records for you really resonate? And, and I guess for some reason, when it took a turn into more of that electronica, did you still feel the connection with the music? Yeah. I mean, well, it's, um, you know, I also have some friends that I've um, gotten into Radiohead. And I think that there's, there's a way to go about it when introducing someone to kind of like taper them into it. Uh, it tapers usually off, but like going into it. Kind of like with Modest Mouse, you you don't want to start someone off with guilty cocker spaniels. You got to ease mm -hmm. them into it with like float on and like the world at large yeah. and more digestible things. Yeah. Um, and so thankfully I was introduced the correct way with the Benz at OK Computer. And those are like my top two. And then um, though those helped me kind of just fall so in love with it and get into that level of understanding to where like by the time I did get to Kid A and, and um, the weirder ones, then it. Yeah, I was like, okay, cool. Like, I, I can I can dig this. It's funny because I saw them play, I want to say 10 years ago in New York at Madison Square Garden. It was all songs I didn't know. And I'm such a huge Radiohead fan, but I was like, please just play something off the bands. And But but I think sometimes they view it. It's fun. A lot of the artists don't, they they really don't like to play their best songs for me. Or, or you know, they. I think that he was really focused on the B-sides at that point. But mm -hmm. uh, I resonate so much with some of the songs from obviously the bands and i think their first record Pablo Honey was amazing too. Mm -hmm. Well, but if you if you like the bands, i don't know how much you know of like the b-sides and stuff, but there is one very special one that is how can you be sure? And i'm pretty sure it's the b-side to yeah. yeah. Is it's fake plastic trees, yeah, right? That's yeah, the b-side. Definitely. There's some there's some really special. There's some gems there for sure. Yeah. Well, let's talk maybe a little bit about your musical journey. At some point, I think the first show you played, mm -hmm. your first cover was like uh, Nine Inch Nails and Johnny Cash has heard, I believe. Was that the first memory you have of like performing on stage? Yeah. Yeah, what, I think What a so. powerful song, by the way. Great song. Yeah. Great song. And so was that, I think your cousin might have had like a gig somewhere or something you performed? No, that was in an acting class, actually. Oh, it was? Okay. It was, yeah. It was, it was in an acting class. And that was like a safer environment i think for me to try that out because um that was a class that we all did just the weirdest things <laughs> and there was and plenty of things that are cringeworthy and plenty of things that are like i don't want to remember that tomorrow and so that's like a it's, it's like a safer safer place to to try out performing do a lot of people actually perform songs in, in acting classes yeah that, they do okay yeah. what age were you when you decided you know what this is definitely a career path for me versus just being a hobby 20. 20. Kind of a late bloomer in it, right? Yeah, very. And what, what was it that you decided? Because at what point you decided, you know what, I think from a hobby to sort of my path in life, this is what I'm going to do. There, there were too many things about it that were right. And I couldn't like deny it anymore. You know, once I really started to fall in love with with performing, because like being in love with songwriting has always been there. But now I'm getting a taste for performing and oh my god I love it and then I'm getting a taste for being in the studio and recording and oh my god I love it and there's so many different parts of being a musician that are all very different people yeah. are like what do you like more the studio or the stage or the writing and I love them all um for different reasons and differently um not one more than the other but there's just so many things about it that are it's just so right that uh, I couldn't not anymore so you're in acting class. You perform Hurt, which is an incredible song, as I mentioned. Is that on video anywhere, by the way? I'd love to see that at some point, I'm Absolutely sure. not. I'm so <laughs> relieved that it is. But there's actually a lot of terrible videos of me singing online, and you can check those out if you really want well, to. Everything I've seen has been great and fantastic. But You haven't dug deep enough then. <laughs> so you perform the song, and at that point, we are like, you know what? I feel like I really 
this is something I want to do. This is definitely my path, my journey. And what was that, about 2018, 2019 or so? Just about, yeah. Okay. And so you, you form your first band, mm -hmm. Soundflowers. And talk to me about that first band and how it came to be. And It was more of a, it was more of a duo. And uh, I called it a band because I didn't know that a duo was like a thing. <laughs> uh, band is usually, f f is it three or four or more? Yeah, Something I mean, like it could be. I mean, there's the White Stripes. Um, there's plenty of like duos. Sure. But, yeah. Um, yeah, and I just, uh, I, I knew I couldn't do it alone, or I didn't feel as though I could do it alone, and it was someone that I trusted and um, had been doing it a lot longer than me, and so I kind of had a safety net with me on stage, and I kind of was, like, following his lead and um, learning as, like, soaking as much in as I can. Like, my brain was a sponge, and I was like, okay, so this is the method for writing, and this is how you perform, and this is how, and I was really just, like, shadowing him uh, essentially and and that was what I wanted I wanted to kind of like sit back and be like I'll do the backup harmonies and backup vocals and I let me watch you and let me learn how to do this and then you know by the time I recorded Wilted and started performing on my own and, and doing my own things I, I felt more ready for it I love the fact that you met Gabriel at the rainbow I believe right which is one of the greatest hangouts. I used to hang out there, but I feel like it's like a time warp. I used warp. to hang out there way too much, <laughs> yeah. man. But it is a bit of a time warp when you walk in there. You're like, Absolutely. There's still people that think it's like 85 or something. You know, like, it's it's cool because that's one of the only places left on the Sunset Strip that still has the history of yeah. it. You know, they're tearing down the Viper Room yeah, and yeah. and they're, they repainted the Roxy. And um, it's just, it's not the same as it was in at least the stuff that I read about. I grew up reading the heroin diaries and yeah. tattoos and tequila and and the dirt. And I'm like, this is what it should be. And the rainbow is the only place there that still is like that. By the way, I tell people that the dirt is my favorite book ever. And they look at me like, "What? Are you, really? There's like all this highbrow literature and the dirt is your favorite book. But it is a fantastic book, by the way. Have you ever read Ishmael? I haven't, but I know that that's one of your favorite books. So you have a tattoo maybe or... Yeah, so I haven't read it, but after this, I'm going to go out and read that. But uh, maybe I'll do Ishmael and The Dirt will be my two favorite books. But for sure, I know that's a great book, so I heard you talk about it before. So talking about, so you play your first few gigs at Soundflowers with Gabriel. And what was that like for you, the, the experience? And did you guys tour? It was it was a really great learning experience. I take every performance I have um, as an opportunity to learn and grow, um, even especially, especially now because I've got like this fantastic band with me and I'm like learning a lot from them. And, um, they're also older than me and they've been doing this for like 15 years. They all met at, uh, MI and they've been playing together. And so I'm like the newbie and, um, I kind of just watch them on stage and learn from them. And if I'm nervous, they give me pep talks. And, um, if we don't get enough time to sound check, then we figure it out. And if a microphone goes out because I screamed too loud, we figure it out. Okay, me and my bassists are going to switch. And, you know, like we just uh, handle things as they come. Mm. And so every single time I've been on stage, there's been something that's happened that I can learn from. Um, Your first week, as I was going to say, like just rewind a bit with Gabriel, were you at the Roxy? Like where were you guys performing early on? Um, I don't even, I mean, but you were, you were performing out about in LA and some of the clubs. And yeah. So. Like, yeah, just, just LA stuff. The place I still, I still play at hotel cafe nice. uh, when they have me. It's nice, really nice. nice. And I always had a good time at good times in Davy Wayne's. Love that um, spot. Obviously pretty much anything the Houston brothers yeah. create is a fantastic I, venue. I live across the street, so I'm there quite a bit. But 2020, you get a deal with Republic. Yes, sir. And so tell me how that came about. Cause obviously from going from a duo where you kind of, a little bit, I guess Gabriel was sort of in the, you know, sort of more of in the, the lead singer spot at that point, but you came out in front and how did you come to get the deal? Well, I, um, I recorded all of my demos out here in LA and then, uh, it's just me and an engineer and, um, my manager had called the guys from Manchester Orchestra who I really look up to and, um, asked if, if they would work with me and they said yes. Amazing. So I sent them all my demos, and a few weeks later, I flew out to Georgia, and uh, I ended up staying for about two and a half weeks. We recorded the entire album in two and a half weeks, and then uh, I got back to LA. I played it for you know my manager and my publicist, and then um, they booked a meeting with Monty in upstate New York, uh, who's my uh, record exec from Republic, and we flew out, and we I just I sat with him, and I had this disc, 
And I was like, well, do you want to hear the ones I think are singles? Or he's like, no, I want to hear all of it. And I was like, you want to hear the entire 45 minute album <laughs> right. right now? It's In a the con- office. The concept record, right? It was at his house. <laughs> like this whole concept record right now, like here. And he's like, yeah. And so we, we put it in, I played it. Um, How are you feeling at that point? Are you nervous? Do you feel like this is no, going well? No, because I was just so proud of it. Yeah. I was so proud of of this record. And um it was a, it was a, it was a story. Yeah, you know, each song it just it, it tells a story. By the time you uh, reach the end of it, it, it's a entire movie almost. And um, I was very proud of it. I didn't know that I could ever create something like that. And the fact that I was able to do it with people that I really admire and look up to yeah. was just a blessing. And um, so I'm just sitting there, and I don't know if he'll like it. I don't know if that's something that um, the stuff that I'm making is something that bigger labels enjoy. I'm I didn't know and. Because it's a concept record. It's a concept, but it's also like alternative folk. And, you know, a lot of major labels don't do a, that. I, I don't know if they do genres like that for the most part. It's, it's mostly pop. Yeah. I feel like um, Lana opened the door for so many artists because that's she's sort of defying genres at, at this point. And so she's getting nominated for all these Grammys. And her music is sort of, I don't know, you would consider dream pop slash indie folk, right? So mm-hmm. I feel like, you know, if it's the right, you're super talented. So at the end of the day, like I'm sure Monty was like, well, I don't know what, you know, I'm not sure what this is going to be, but he obviously loved it enough to sit through the whole record. So. Yeah, sat through the whole thing. And then, um, yeah, at the end of it, he was like, all right, cool. Like, Let's go. We want to work with you if you want to work with us. And I was like, okay. <laughs> so It's yeah, funny because a lot of bands have to showcase and they're they're playing for a year or two, but that's amazing how quickly it happened. You got to work with your second favorite band, I think, at the time, but maybe now they're your first, Manchester Orchestra. Uh, and Andy produced the record. Mm-hmm. So talk to me about someone like, you know, Andy's production versus Butch Walker, who we'll talk about in a moment, and how it differs. Um, the, There's kind of a big difference between the way they, they produce, because I'm, I'm in the studio with Andy and Rob, and they I, I get to be there throughout the entire process. We'll have some days that are, you know, 10 or more hours long, and I'm, I'm watching how they create. And I'm watching how they do all the things and I'm, I'm trying to take in as much as I can because, again, I want to learn, you know, watching whoever it is, if it's a bandmate, if it's a, a friend, if it's someone I admire on an actual stage. I want to see Bright Eyes and I'm like studying Conor Oberst. Like, <laughs> what are the moves he's doing right now? I want to, you know, mimic that. Yeah. And um, so just like watching them being like, because I want to learn how to do this on my own. I want to learn how to produce. And um, with, with Butch, it was completely different because I, I would show up. I'd, I'd play the song for him, and I'd be like, this is what I got so far. Uh, I don't know if you want to rewrite the chorus, if you want to add a bridge, if you want to keep it as is or whatever, but, like, this is what I'm, I'm coming up with, and um, these are some references. Like, I kind of like this Interpol song, and I kind of like this Audio Slave song, and let me know if we can maybe, like, combine the two and give those elements, whatever. And uh, and Butch is like, okay, got it. Come back tomorrow. And I'm there for, like, maybe, like, 20 minutes, and then I come back the next day, and the track's built, drawn, everything is just done by the way he's so underrated and the nicest guy so underrated. i'm friendly with him and i love butch and you know he's so talented and Beyond. uh and i love the new music you're making with him are there other songs coming up by the way that you okay so there's there's more to come well this record this past record you did the 20 in 2020 wilted reached number one on the u.s itunes charts which is incredible do you feel a pressure to succeed in music at this time or did it just were you not thinking about singles and being successful on your first record were you just sort of making a record and and thinking i'm going to put this out there in the universe and whatever happens happens or are you thinking about success and you know just sort of all that comes with that in music i think success is a very relative term mm, true um I'm about to go on tour with Silver Sun fucking pickups. Amazing. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know what That's I mean? It. Like, That's I'm it. stoked. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, there's no, uh, it's not about numbers for me. Yeah, true. So success is, you're right, it's all relative. But you've been, say, I heard you say that music saved your life. And I guess when you made that first record, that was a big part of it. So talk to me about that. And I know you're a huge advocate for mental health and what mm-hmm. that all means to you. I don't really think I can uh, necessarily help people with mental health health issues because I'm not a medical professional. Mm. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to have a therapist that I really like, and it took me 10 years to find him, but I have one that I like, and I have a ways to keep myself healthy and to work at it one day at a time. Um, but I'm by no means... Uh, An expert. 
Yeah, yeah. like I yeah. can't cure anything. I mean, there's there's little tidbits I can get, like get 15 minutes of direct sunlight a day. Like right. that's something. And, you know, there, there's little tidbits that I can I can give out, stuff that's helped me. But what, what works for me may not work for another person. And yeah. that's why, you know, if the issues are bad enough, you should seek help. Yeah, no um, Personally, hearing music that makes me feel understood and less alone helps. Definitely. That's one. That's one of the many uh, moving parts of good mental health for me. For sure, it's just it's not just music. It's it's a lot of other things. But feeling understood, not feeling alone, is a is a big part of it. For sure, I'm sure. So talk to me about some of your favorite moments in music, some of your favorite gigs. I know you did some did a great show with Luke from the Struts where you got to play in front of like a thousand people. You heard it was great? I heard it was great. Well, I heard that I think you were- Someone I think... is lying to you because <laughs> well, I forgot all the lyrics. Well, it was like a thousand people. I no, know it was more than that, more dude. Than a thousand there was people. a thousand okay. for like my set. Okay. There was like five or six for his set. <laughs> right. And he was like, come on stage. And I'm like, I don't think that's a good idea. And he's like, no, you should. And I'm like, I feel like I'm gonna forget the lyrics. And he's like, just do it, it's fine. And I get on stage and I forget all of the lyrics. I was like, cool, I'm never doing that again. Well, you did that, but you also got to perform with one of my favorite bands, Cheap Trick. Oh, yeah. I and took that, my top off. That was really fun. But performing with them had to be a highlight, a career highlight for you, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So how did that come to be? How did you meet the guys in Cheap Trick? I don't know them at all. They saw me sitting side stage, and I had whipped off my shirt <laughs> from side stage. and was just like swinging it around, and one of them was like, Come get up stage, here. Right. And then my friend's like, he's calling you up there. I was like, no, he's not. She's like, he's calling you up there. <laughs> and I was like, all right. So I ran out on stage without a shirt and I like swung it around. And then I was like, he like bowed at me and then I bowed back and I ran back to the side of stage. And then- uh, We're talking they, about Rick Nielsen, by the way, the guitar player. It was it was him and the singer. Uh, but like, Robert yeah, Taylor, it was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was yeah. him and the singer. And um, yeah, and then they had a couple other people come on stage and sing, and then they brought me back out and had me sing one of their songs. Now, did you get nervous when you play? Because I know Mick Jagger still gets nervous years later. Like, mm, it depends. Depends. Okay. It depends. Like for the, it, it depends on the size. Like if I've played, if I'm about to go and do an acoustic show, say tonight, it's gonna be fine because I've already done a million. So, like a, a show in front of like 30, 50 people, like I don't get nervous about that. But then you know I'll move to a. 200 seater and then I'll get nervous the first three times and then I'll do like a thousand seater and then I get nervous the first few times now like when I go out and there's a thousand people it's not as uh I'm not as nervous it's funny when Mick Jagger told me he still gets nervous I'm like all right well then everyone gets nervous because it is daunting and I think if you you know it's funny a lot of bands you, you start to play for 200 500 by the time you're up to thousands it's you know you look out you can't see anyone but it's still still daunting a little bit but yeah. I mean I feel like if you're not nervous probably means you don't care. And if you don't care, it means you either need a bigger stage or you should do something else. That's true. Well, talk to me about the new music you're making with our friend Butch Walker mm -hmm. and Lighthouse specifically. Mike McCready played on it. How did that all come about? Because it's a great track, grunge inspired. I know that you, I feel like you were going through like a 90s phase at that point because there's a lot of references to a lot of that music, the grunge era music. I don't know if I'd call it a phase because it's been happening for like a decade now. <laughs> Inspiration, maybe. I'm almost 25, so that would be <laughs> roughly a decade now right, that right. I've been uh, in love with this style. But uh, yeah, no, Lighthouse was actually less grunge oriented and more like Weezer true. inspired. It was true. a lot more like Weezer. Um, and Just You, which was the single that followed it, was more. Um, Granddaddy and Cranberries influenced. Mm. I don't know if you know Granddaddy, but they're yeah. fantastic. Band. Definitely, definitely. So you meet Butch, mm -hmm. and then all of a sudden you start working on your music. And does he bring in Mike McCready? Um, well, how it came about was I, I actually met Butch, like I think it was probably 2016. We met and became friends. And uh, we had talked for like five years about like doing music loosely here and there. We'd like talk about it and nothing ever happened and because he's in very high demand. And, um, had you heard Marvelous 3? Were you a fan of his old band? I was more so a fan of his solo stuff. Okay. I was more so a fan of like the, his Stay Gold record. Um, really just incredible. And um, he had me do some backup vocals and some speaking on one of his um, – concept records a few years ago and then he called me back into the studio like a year later and was like we want to do some backup vocals for this uh 
this song my friend's doing, it's going to be in an indie movie, and da, 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 da. I didn't really know anything about it. Turns out it was Peanut Butter Falcon. Huge. And um, I was like, oh, f- cool. Uh, and so we had been in the studio together, we'd done things like that, but it was never anything like for my music. And then when this came about, he's friends with Mike McGreedy, so right. um, he asked Mike to play on it, and I guess he said yes. I wasn't there for it, so I still haven't met Mike, but... Um, but I'm sure you I have will. a lot of gratitude for him. Definitely. Yeah. And lyrically, talk to me about where your inspirations are coming from for this new music you're putting out. Because it's much different than your first record, which was a concept record in, in sorts, right? So lyrics are very similar. Yeah. Very, very similar. So you they're draw- all they're all still folk songs. Like some- if you if you break down Lighthouse and you play it on just acoustic guitar, it's folk. Same you, thing with just you. Do you do you get some of them from dreams? Do you dream sometimes and write down your dreams? And- no, my dreams are always um weird, gory, like horror movie type dreams, which I love, or they're like, I don't know, like animals. Like I dream <laughs> I dream about animals a lot. It's funny because you even work with Eli Roth at your first video. So I maybe, love him, yeah. yeah. There might be a connection there with the gory movies. <laughs> and talk to me a little bit about, obviously you, you do so many things and we can't not talk about fashion and what it means to you. I mean, you've had the cover of Flaunt not long ago. In fact, I think that's one of the places I met you with Evan briefly. Okay, yeah. Um, and then obviously the cover of Spin, which is what this podcast is all about. So tell me about fashion, what it means to you. Are you do you feel more connected sometimes to the music or the fashion side of what you're doing or both equally as much? Um, there are a lot of crossovers, um, and and similarities between the two worlds. Self-expression is one of the main similarities with it. Um, but I see music as more of, uh, who I am. Mm. Um, and it's more of like a a soul connection and my love for fashion is, uh, more human oriented, you know, less soul, more human. Um, but there's a lot of, of brands and designers that, I really just resonate with uh, Vivian Westwood being one of them, you know, um, rest in peace. There's, I don't know if there's a designer that's more punk rock than her. Totally. You know, self-expression and and not giving a fuck and being exactly who you are and um, bending rules and just, she's just really cool, man. So I would assume if you land a huge gig with Calvin Klein or you're working with the Dave LaChapelle or whoever it may be, I mean, do you feel more connected and excited about getting a festival or your, you know, your next single is breaking or is, is the fashion just as important to you? I, I see them as two completely different things. I don't really ever compare them. Mm. Um, art's art though, yeah. you know, like if I get to work with a cool designer that truly loves the art of it and is really expressing themselves and really, you know, and they need assistance with putting that art on display, which is like, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be the mannequin and, and put your art on me and I get to show the world what you want to create. Like, that's fantastic. Are there still some photographers you want to work with and designers that you're really... I loved working with Mario Sorrenti and I want Amazing. to keep shooting with him. He's a good guy. Yeah. I like him too. And are there, are there brands that you're like, I really want to get... I mean, I've done this and that, but there's this is my dream brand well, to work with. I can't with. get away from... I, I can't get... Not away from... I can't get enough of... Gautier. I did mm. walk uh, for Gautier right. for um, his his final show as a designer, but um, the, you know the, the more the better. I, I love that brand. I love that designer. Um, Galliano, Vivian Westwood, obviously. Amazing. Well, talk to me about a little bit about you going. You were just on tour, and you're going out on tour. You mentioned Silver Sun Pickup. So, mm. what's tour life you like now as opposed to when you first started? Do you like touring? I love touring. Did you tour in a van initially and now? I love to tour. You love to tour. So no matter where it is, you'll play wherever. Yeah, what, pretty tell much. Me, tell me about your band and tell me about tour life for you now. Um, they are my family. and They all went to MI, which I went, went to. to. I MI went there together. too, by the way, but That's a, sweet. a long time ago. Um, yeah, they, they, um, they really look out for me and we have an actual... Like friendship, it doesn't feel like we're coworkers. It feels like home when we're on the road. And uh, actually, there was this really cool moment in the van on this last tour with the, the revivalists. Um, I was sitting behind my guitar player, and his name's his name's Michael, and um, he just said something along the lines of like, "Hey guys, like I just wanted to say like thanks, and I've always wanted to do this." And my drummer in the front said something's <laughs> like, "What? Like listen to Leonard Skinner or something like that?" And he's like, "No, like this, like just this." 
And there was this moment where we were all like, oh, like same dude. Like, cause we've, we all come from, you know, different cities and different backgrounds and different ages. Um, but at one point we were all in eighth grade listening to ACDC yeah. and we're like, this is what I want to do when I grow <laughs> up. And here we are like in a band with really cool fellows and we have a good time and we laugh a lot and we're doing what we love. I saw a great version of No Rain, the Blind Melon song that you did. So are there other covers that you're doing on tour? Yeah, I always cover a Manchester song, regardless of whether it's acoustic or, you know, live band. Might uh, there be a Radiohead cover in your future? I thought about it, and I even tried it with my band. Um, my voice is just not there yet. Well, it's definitely great. But you do cover Bright Eyes sometimes, because I've definitely seen oh, yeah. some of those clips. So. Yeah. And the new music that you're working on now, can we talk a little bit about the songs that are dropping? It's funny that people now, and especially, you know, initially Wilted was your first album, but I think a lot of artists now, they just drop EPs and singles, and so there's a different way for people to consume music. And I don't think music was meant to be consumed in 30 second intervals like TikTok and how people consume it, but people seem to be consuming it in a different way now. So talk to me about the, the process of you dropping music now, and I think it's mostly singles, right? Or is there a full length record coming up? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I have I have an album and I would like to release it. Awesome. Um, the next uh, the next move would be would be releasing the title track. And I just got the mix back final mix back yesterday i had like one little note and then we're sending it off to mastering so that will come out when maybe august or something august no Sooner, honey we're like... trying to do it around my tour <laughs> like <laughs> no like a month or no something. yeah like asap amazing amazing ASAP. yeah ideally around the time that i go on tour okay great so hopefully by the time this drops it'll be out or maybe around the time period uh, is there more acting in your future i know you did star you did a, a ton of acting stuff so do you feel like there's a lot more acting in your future coming up sure yeah. Is that something you love to do? Are you passionate about it? It depends on the role and it depends yeah. on the location. For sure. Well, we'll definitely be looking out for that. Talking about the Troubadour show. I know mm -hmm. you did a show in November at the Troubadour. How was that for you? Uh, that was great. I did two shows in November at the Troubadour. That was fantastic. The first one was with the Cortinas and the second one was with a friend of mine, Royal and the Serpent. And She's actually um, on the show Monday. Really? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Well, her boyfriend was just on the show this past week. Mm -hmm. So yeah, she's coming up. I'm excited to have her here. She's fantastic. Let's talk about the tour coming up. Mm -hmm. Silver Sun Pickups. Great tour. Where are you hitting? I don't actually have the tour dates in we front of me. We start so. in Alabama. I think we're hitting... I think we're hitting Cincinnati. There's like a couple Midwest Midwest spots, but it's mostly the South, like NOLA and uh, Texas. There's like five Texas states. Okay. Is there a favorite um, city that you have that you want to go back to that you did on the last tour? For some reason, I always just have a blast in Boston. Every time I have a show in Boston. Well, you did Boston Calling, right? I did Boston Calling, and then, yeah, yeah like, oh, was it a few months later or something like that? I did the show with the revivalists there. Um, they just, they they appreciate live music there. They do. It was Cheap Trick. It was a strut. So, obviously, that's a, a great memory for you, I'd imagine. Mm -hmm. One thing I wanted to ask you before you go is five albums that you can't live without. So let's, we can I'm take Wide Awake It's Morning by Bright Eyes, The Benz, Radiohead. Um, means Everything to Nothing, Manchester Orchestra, Midnight Organ Fight, Frightened Rabbit, and Beatles Greatest Hits. Amazing. I was going to say, okay, computer, but, uh, Maybe, maybe that's top 10, but not uh, top, top 10, uh, top 10 top for 10. sure. Awesome. Well, it's so great to have you here, Paris. Thank you so much for coming in. Anything else we should touch base on besides the tour dates, the new record, any other projects that you have coming up? Are you still doing art too, I think, right? Pardon? Are you still painting and doing some art? I do, but painting's more so for me. You know, it's more like I don't really... I'll post stuff here and there, but it, I don't really plaster it on my social media. It's I like the meditative state it puts me in. It's similar to rock climbing where it's just, you know... It's my uh, my happy place. I feel like I'd be a very bad uh, rock climber because I'm not I'm terrible at that kind of stuff. But uh, I thought I would be too, but, but you know. Well, let's talk a little bit about the new single. We're going to tease it out. It's not coming out till uh, I believe. When is it coming out, Zan? Uh, around the time of my tour with Silver Sun Pickups. Okay, but tell me about what you can tell me about about the new single. Um, Interpol, Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, are the um, 
production inspirations, uh, songwriting inspirations would be Andy Hall and Connor Oberst. Was it done with Butch Walker? No. No, okay. And is this the song that you think will be the lead off single to the next record? It's the title track. Amazing, I love it. Well, I'm excited to hear it, so thank you. And we got a little bit of a scoop there, so I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. Well, I appreciate you coming in. It's great to have you here. I'm finally glad that we can make this happen, and uh, it's a pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Paris.